Hey everybody, what's going on? This is Sam with Historic Travels. And as always, before we get started today, I'd just like to take a quick moment to welcome all my new subscribers and to thank everybody who's leaving me comments and messages down below. Thank you guys, I really appreciate it. And in case you all missed my channel announcement video yesterday, I just announced that I did a complete overhaul on the Historic Travels Patreon page. So if you would like to check that out, there's a link for that in the description. Awesome, guys. Thank you all for all your support. And to all my new patrons who just signed up, thank you all so much. It means a lot. And to all my existing patrons, thank you all so much as well. All right, so on to today's topic. As we all know, April is quickly approaching, and you know what that means? It's Titanic month, so there will be a lot of Titanic content on this channel over the course of April as we cover the events of the disaster and talk about the story of the Titanic and, you know, everything that happened to her in the month of April, because this is the 109th year anniversary of the sinking of the Titanic, so I want to cover that right. Now, before April comes, though, I wanted to talk about another ship. You see, most people don't know this, but in the month of April, the White Star Line had another disaster. And this disaster was the worst disaster to come upon the White Star Line before the sinking of the Titanic. Now, what am I referring to? Well, I'm referring to a ship called the Atlantic. The Atlantic sunk on April 1st, 1873, almost 40 years before the events of the Titanic. And you see, the events of the Atlantic sinking were catastrophic. You know, it had a great loss of life. And as I said, this event was the worst disaster to hit the White Star Line until the Titanic. But today, this disaster is almost forgotten about. So I thought I would do my part and tell the story of the Atlantic and try to shed some light on what happened to this famous ocean liner over 100 years ago. The SS Atlantic was built in the year 1870, and it was part of a fleet of ships known as the Oceanic class of ocean liners, and these vessels were state-of-the-art, very safe, very well built, and they had the brand new revolutionary steam engine. Now, even though steam engines had been around for quite a few decades at this point, them being implemented in ocean liner vessels, like transatlantic vessels, was still a relatively new concept, so the public wasn't very comfortable with them yet. So when you look at vessels from this period, like you see in these pictures here, even though these ships did have steam engines, they would still equip these vessels with sails en masse in order to make the public have peace of mind. So if something was to happen to the steam engines, the ship would still be able to proceed under wind power to its final destination. During the time of the Atlantic, this was a very busy time for the White Star Line and any other shipping companies as well. You see, during this time period, there was a huge amount of people wanting to immigrate from Europe to America. So the transatlantic crossing route was very busy for these ocean liner companies. So another thing you have to keep in mind is while the Atlantic and other vessels in the oceanic class were very revolutionary and very state of the art for the time, making a transatlantic crossing on these ships was still a very dangerous thing to do. You know, these ships, while powerful for the 1800s, could still be heavily influenced by wind, you know, rough sea conditions, you know, stuff like that could very heavily influence these ships and greatly extend the length of a crossing. So people did not make this crossing lightly. You know, they did a lot of prep work. There were some cases where a husband would actually leave his wife and child, take the crossing early, and then once he got settled, then he would send for his wife and children. You know, he didn't want them to risk the crossing until, you know, they had something waiting for them in America to make the, make the crossing worth the risk. So what the White Star Line did in order to help the women and children whose husbands had already left for America and they were just sailing to join them, what they did was they segregated them to different parts of the ship so that the single women and children wouldn't be harassed by the single men. So on the Atlantic, single men were kept in the bow of the ship. Single women and children were kept in the ship's stern, while complete families, you know, husband, wife, and children, were kept in the center of the ship. Now, this whole system that the White Star Line did in order to, you know, keep the single women away from the single men in order to avoid harassment was a very good concept for the time, and it actually worked pretty well as far as keeping the level of harassment down. However, when it came to the story of the Atlantic and the way that this ship would eventually sink, this would have drastic consequences for the women and children on board the ship. Alright, so now that you have a basic understanding of what life was like on board the SS Atlantic and the way that these ships operated at the time, let's now jump ahead to the year 1873, when the SS Atlantic departed Liverpool for its final voyage across the Atlantic bound for New York. The first few days of the Atlantic's voyage went without incident. The weather was good, the sea was calm, and passengers on board the ship were enjoying life on board this revolutionary ocean liner. However, all that changed several days into the voyage. 
The Atlantic encountered a massive storm system that was traveling in the direction opposite of which that the ship was taking. So the storm was moving east as the ship was heading west. And because of this, the ship was now fighting massive winds that were beating into the side of the ship. The waves around the ship were also swelling, causing massive waves to slam into the ship's hull. Several times during this crossing, the Atlantic almost capsized, but the ship was able to right itself. But as you can kind of see, Conditions on the Atlantic during this crossing were not pleasant for those on board. Now this storm would have another big impact on the Atlantic, and that was the speed at which the ship was traversing the ocean. So as the ship was proceeding, the captain would send a ship's officer down below to add up the amount of coal that was still on board. Because where this storm was slowing the ship down so much, the captain became concerned that they wouldn't have enough coal to reach New York. And with the wind blowing in the opposite direction that the ship was going, Wind power wasn't really an option for this ship to reach New York. The only option they had was the steam engine. So when this man went down below to add up how much coal was on board, the captain didn't know this, but this officer had a tendency to underestimate the amount of coal that the ship had when he made his report to the captain. So essentially what I mean is if the Atlantic had 160 tons of coal left, he would report 130, so the captain would exercise on the side of caution and they wouldn't be caught without coal. However, when he did this, he didn't know it at the time, but when he reported this, the captain did the math and figured out that that much coal would not be enough for the ship to reach New York under the conditions that they were currently facing. Ironically enough, the Atlantic did in fact have enough coal on board to reach New York. However, due to this underestimation by this ship's officer, the captain of the ship had no way of knowing that. So, since he was very much concerned that the Atlantic would not have enough coal to reach New York, he decided to divert the ship to Halifax, Nova Scotia, in order to dock the ship there, spend the night, and then they would restock the ship on coal, food, and other provisions, and then carry on from there to New York City. This map shows the SS Atlantic's original route represented by the black line going across the Atlantic to New York City, and it also shows the SS Atlantic's new route represented by the red line after the ship diverted from its New York City crossing to Halifax, Nova Scotia. So as you can see, Halifax, Nova Scotia is not that far from New York City. Once the Atlantic docked there, restocked on food provisions, and waited for the storm to pass, it would only take the ship about two days to go from there to New York City. One thing to remember about the city of Halifax, while it was a popular destination for ships to go to in order to resupply, it was a very dangerous harbor to approach if you didn't know what you were doing. You see, there's a lot of sharp rocks, there's a lot of shallow water, a lot of things that could pose a hazard to ships sailing into the harbor if you didn't know what you were doing. Now, in the Atlantic's case, what made this even worse was that most of the crew on board the Atlantic had never been to Halifax before. The captain had, but his crew hadn't, including the officer he had in charge of the ship the night the accident occurred. Now, in order to help ships navigate into the harbor, the city of Halifax had a big lighthouse built right on the shoreline in order to help guide ships in. And it had been a long day for the captain, and around midnight on April 1st, he decided to go and get a couple of hours of sleep before the ship would arrive in Halifax. Now, the Atlantic was due to arrive in Halifax sometime around 3 or 4 a.m. on the morning of April 1st, and he told his crew to wake him up no later than 3 a.m or if they spotted that lighthouse. That'd be the time frame that he would want to be woken up. Now, unbeknownst to, unknown to the captain and the crew, the Atlantic had actually been pushed 12 miles further south by the currents and rough waves of the Atlantic at the time of the ship's sailing. So 3 a.m. came and went, and the crew on the bridge of the Atlantic never saw the lighthouse. So they figured they were actually further away from the coastline than what they originally thought. So they never woke up the captain. Now the officer who made this call to not wake up the captain, not too long after he gave that order, he would soon come to realize that he had just made a grave mistake. This map shows the new position of the Atlantic after it was pushed 12 miles further south by the ocean currents and the storm. As you can see, the ship is coming in nowhere near the city of Halifax. The ship ended up coming ashore, as I said, 12 miles further south. And as it approached the shoreline, it was actually approaching an island not far off the coast called Mars Island nowhere near the city of Halifax or that lighthouse that they were expecting to see as they approached the shoreline. And you see, as the Atlantic ended up approaching Mars Island by mistake, what the crew didn't know is not far off of Mars Island, there is a giant rock called Golden Rule Rock. This rock's about 50 to 100 yards or so off of the coast of Mars Island. And while the crew on board the ship didn't know it, they were actually heading for a direct impact with this giant boulder just off the coast of Mars Island. 
The lookouts on the Atlantic spotted the shoreline of Mars Island around 3.15 a.m. So the crewman who was in charge of the ship ordered the Atlantic to turn, and he also ordered the engines on the Atlantic to be put at full speed astern in order to try to stop the ship before impact. However, at this point, it was too late. The Atlantic sails right towards Golden Rule Rock and hits it at nearly full speed. And the sudden momentum change of this ship going at full speed and then suddenly stopping douses every single light on board the ship instantly. You have to remember, the lights on board this ship were oil lamps. They weren't electric at the time. Now, the back part of the ship, which is still sticking out, uh, out to sea, starts getting slammed by waves, and that pushes the ship further inward. And the rapidly spinning propeller then starts grinding up on rocks, shedding the propeller blade instantly, and opening further holes in the engine room, thus allowing the Atlantic to rapidly flood. Right after the Atlantic got stuck on the rocks, the captain was on the bridge almost immediately, and he gave the crew three orders. Number one was to wake up all the passengers and crew, which wouldn't be hard because most of them got thrown from their beds when the ship made contact with Golden Rule Rock. Number two was to begin to launch distress rockets, and number three was to prep and get the lipos ready to be launched. Now, it didn't take long after impact for some passengers to begin working their way up to the boat decks, and one of the lifeboats from the Atlantic was launched almost instantly. However, the sea was so rough that night that as soon as this lifeboat, which was full of people, made contact with the water, the lifeboat was literally picked up and thrown against the hull of the Atlantic, shattering, every, shattering the boat to pieces and killing everyone on board. Now, at this point, the captain realized that it was too dangerous for them to launch any more lifeboats, so he ordered the lifeboat launching to be halted until he could figure out something else to do. Now, something else that the crew and the captain didn't know was that they only had about a five minute window after the ship got stuck on the rocks before the Atlantic would become too unstable for them to do anything. You see, the back part of the ship, which was the most critically damaged by those rocks, was actually being supported by those rocks to some degree. It was actually keeping the back part of the ship relatively high out of the water. However, as the start of the ship began to lose buoyancy due to the flooding, the back part of the Atlantic slid off of those rocks and at this point, the Atlantic developed a very strong list, throwing everybody off the deck and knocking several people into the ocean. Around 3.22 a.m., the back part of the Atlantic loses its footing on the rocks, and the ship begins to list 30 degrees to port, submerging the entire back section of the Atlantic instantly, drowning all of the single women and children families that were still in their cabins almost instantly. Some of the survivors on board the Atlantic said that they could hear the screaming of the women and children still within the ship, and then within a minute or two after the rolling began, all of the sounds in that part of the ship died away as all the people inside drowned. You have to remember that with just a five minute window from the moment that the Atlantic got stuck on the rocks to the moment that the ship began to list, that wasn't anywhere near enough time to get everybody out of the ship. Gotta yeah, remember, this ship was plunged into total darkness upon impact, and this ship had over 900 people on board. So just imagine being woken up in the middle of the night, all the lights are out, and you're disoriented, you know, trying to figure out what's going on. And then you've also got 900 people trying to climb up the very few stairwells within the ship, trying to get up to the boat deck. I mean, there was no way that most of these people could get out on time. This ship, was a, this ship went from being asleep to all hell breaking loose almost instantly. So as the ship continued to sink, it was too dangerous for them to launch any lifeboats. So what some people actually tried to do was take ropes from the ship and actually try to secure them on rocks close to the mainland. And several people actually did end up pulling this off. And that is how a good chunk of people on board the Atlantic were evacuated. They no joke just you know, grabbed onto a rope and pulled themselves off the Atlantic and just pulled themselves through the sea and got up on these rocks. I mean, there was nothing else they could do. And you see, as the, all of this was still going on, the Atlantic was continuing to roll onto the port side, listing further and further. And eventually, all escape for anybody still unfortunate enough to be within the ship was 100% impossible. At this late stage of the sinking, if you were still within the Atlantic's interior, there was no way for you to get out on your own. You see, the people that were still alive within the ship's midsection began pounding on the porthole windows, trying to get the attention of the people that were hanging onto the ship's outer hull, just like walking on the side of the ship that was still above the waterline. And eventually, they did get the attention of some of the ship's crew that were still walking on the hull. And they did successfully break the windows of these porthole windows, and they did get a fair number of people out that were still trapped in the ship's interior. And it was because of this action that they were able to rescue the one and only child to survive the entire sinking of the Atlantic. I want all of you to remember something here. Out of this entire disaster, only one child survived the entire sinking of the Atlantic. And all the women on board, 
not a single woman survived the entire sinking of the ship. And this wasn't just due to negligence of the ship's crew or anything. This was just because of their positions within the wreck. Remember, all the single women and children were located in the ship's stern, and all the families were located in the center sections of the ship. So, you know, based on where they were and how little time they had, they just didn't have time to escape. And the reason so many men survived was because the bow of the Atlantic was one of the last parts to go under, so they had more time to try to get out of the ship. I mean, I honestly just can't comprehend how horrible of a disaster this would be. This really sheds light on, honestly, how lucky the people on the Titanic were that the ship ended up sinking the way that it did. You know, the Titanic kind of makes us take ships sinking for granted. You know, because the Titanic had this long calm before the storm before all hell broke loose, even though the Titanic had a much greater loss of life than the Atlantic, the people on board still had a much higher chance to escape the ship, you know, to survive because they had more time to figure out what was going on. With the Atlantic, they had no such luxury. Such luxury. The ship fell into chaos almost instantly, and that is why so many people died the night the Atlantic sank. Now, it did take some time, but around the area in which the Atlantic sank, there were a lot of small fishing villages, and people there had a bunch of small boats, and they did take those boats out to help rescue people on the Atlantic. But it just, it took a while for them to get there, because you have to remember how slow communication was at the time, and due to the rapid way that the ship sank, you know, most of the damage had been done by the time they got there. The only people that were still alive were the people that had made it to the rocks by those ropes and the people that were still clinging to the Atlantic's hull. And you also have to remember how rough the ocean was that night. These people that came to help, all they had were small little rowboats and fishing boats, you know, nothing like a big ocean liner. So it was a big job to try to recover and save several people in the water once the rescue effort was underway. Now, of the roughly 950 people or so that were on board the Atlantic, only 550 would end up surviving the sinking. So that was a huge loss of life on the Atlantic. I mean, it's unbelievable to think about, to be honest. And you also have to remember that the sinking of the SS Atlantic would be the very worst disaster to ever come upon the White Star Line until the sinking of the RMS Titanic nearly 40 years later. Anyway, guys, that's it for this video. Thank you all so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it and found it interesting. And yeah, now you know the story of the White Star Line's worst disaster before the sinking of the Titanic. And before you all go, I need to give a quick shout out to Tom Linsky and his team over at Part-Time Explorer. They're the ones who created these incredible animations that you saw of the Atlantic in this video. And if you're curious in learning more about the Atlantic and knowing the complete story of the disaster, Tom Linsky actually made a one hour documentary film covering the disaster in extreme detail. It's an incredible film and I highly recommend you all go watch it. I will post a link to that down below. Thank you guys, I appreciate it. All right guys, well hey, thank you all so much for being here. Thank you all so much for watching. And yeah, stay tuned for the new videos that are gonna be coming on this channel as Titanic week begins. All right everybody, well hey, you all stay safe out there and I'll see you in the next one. Have a good night everybody.